Fort Saint-Joseph. Presque cent ans ont passé depuis que les Français ont construit ce fort pour servir de mission et de poste de traite. Mais depuis la conquête, le fort est aux mains des Anglais. I've lived here almost 20 years and I've never seen so many canoes, people or musket voyageurs, immigrants from France, red coat British regular, even some local Potawatomi gathering here at the crossing of the old Sock and Grand River Trail. It's been a long walk to get to the fort. I hope it's worth it. Me and the other settlers are still in a tissy fit over the damn Brits and their proclamation of 1763. Who do they think they are? Telling us that white folks can't settle west of the Appalachians? Now we've been hearing some rumblings that war is brewing and our men gotta get some drilling for fighting. While they're playing soldier, us women folk will use the time to catch up on news and me and my children maybe even have some fun. I expect this area may soon be prized as a military strategic area. It is my duty and in my best interest to muster with the local militia for what appears to be the eve of a revolution. Fort St. Joseph in this area was so important in colonial America because it anchored the whole southern Lake Michigan region for New France uh, and later the English, but it anchored this region. We think, well, it's a small fort in, in sort of a backwoods area. Yes, but it was on the great highway of the time, which were the, the lakes and the rivers. It anchored the southern Lake Michigan region. You could come down Lake Michigan, ascend the St. Joseph River, portage into the Kankakee. The Kankakee took you into the Illinois, and the Illinois took you into the Mississippi, and you were going all the way down to Louisiana and, and New Orleans. It was tremendously important as a diplomatic post. The Crown could never afford to station enormous numbers of soldiers here. There weren't a tremendous number of French civilians here uh, to hold this area for the French Crown, but they could influence the Native Americans, and that's really what it was all about. The fur trade, influencing the natives, they could provide a great military force, so if you were trying to keep the English out, Fort St. Joseph could help you do it. It anchored this whole region for New France. The Crown could never afford to garrison the hundreds of soldiers, regular troops, that they would have needed uh, to defend a community like this. So the militia was a vital uh, community defense force uh, in time of war, and that's what the men are training to do. Well, militia muster was a day for the militia of a town, a community, a fort, to gather together to learn the manual of arms, learn military drill, and be prepared to act as a home defense force uh, in time of war. If their community was attacked by an invading force out here at a place like Fort St. Joseph, it might be uh, Native Americans, uh, they could prepare to defend their community. And it was a day of uh, also of socializing, getting together, having a little bit of fun, and then learning to train as militia. The uh, fifes and drums played signals like reveille in the morning for troops to get out of their beds and come out of their tents. Uh, a tune called Roast Beef was used to signal that food was ready in the camps. Um, then while marching there were cadences used to keep the troops on beat and then on the battlefield different signals for loading, for firing, retreating, everything was signaled through music. Historians don't tend to do the reenacting thing, but reenactors do one thing that, uh, that is 
uh, that should be more appreciated in the historical community, and that is pushing the boundaries of trying to understand who these people were, actually using the tools they were using, doing the things they were doing, eating what they were eating, and get, really getting to understand why, who were these people, why were they doing this, how were they doing this, filling the picture, and essentially giving texture to the knowledge. So I am a, uh, a hunter and a farmer, and I was a uh, ordinary or tavern keep uh, back east. And I am, we are so destined to go to St. Louis where we can hopefully afford uh, to buy a tavern of our own. We uh, live 16 miles northeast of here in a small settlement, my wife and I and my nephew. And uh, we basically come here to get supplies, do some trading, uh, hear some, some uh, speeches, and to also see, hear the latest news and find out what's going on because the, the uh, newspapers don't reach us. We do not get mail. And the only way that we have uh, to find out what the rest of civilization is doing is to come to these social gatherings. We heard that St. Louis is a growing concern and anyone who wishes to make his fortune can go to St. Louis and uh, the streets are veritably lined with gold, so the French tell me. My name is William Connolly. I was born in the city of Carrickfergus, Ireland, right on the sea, just across from England. Make ready. Present. Fire. A hard times fell upon us in Ireland, uh, close to close to now, and I came over to America, and I uh, I was accepted into uh, my aunt and uncle's home, and we are moving out west to seek our fortunes abroad, and hopefully. Um, if fortune serves me right, I can set up as a shopkeeper in the city of St. Louis. Well, reenactors are, I like to think of them as experimental archaeologists. We're taking the written documentation, we're taking uh, visual images from paintings and so forth, we're taking the physical archaeology that is being done at a site like Fort St. Joseph, and we're actually trying it out, we're putting it into use. How did these things really work? Uh, it's one thing to, uh, to see it done or to, to read about it being done. It's a very different thing to try it out, see does it actually work the way we think it does. And so we get together at events like this one and, uh, and try out the archaeology ourselves. I'm a pewter caster, and what pewter is is an alloy metal. It's a combination of tin and copper, and I buy in a bar like this called an ingot. And I take the ingot, I put it in the pot here on top of the fire, heat it up to its melting point, 600 degrees, turn it into melted pewter. It kind of looks like a silver soup, but that's 600 degree melted pewter. And what I have is an 18th century spoon mold, and on the mold I put talc powder. Talc works as a release, makes the metal flow and come out of the mold easier. So now we're going to put the two sides together. <laughs> we're going to clamp it down. We'll pick up the hot metal and we'll slowly pour it in the mold. Now you'll watch closely, see how shiny the end is. As the metal cools, it's going to turn color. It's going to go from shiny to a frosted gray. Just like that. We'll open it up. Yeah, that's for a solid spoon. Now, unfortunately, this one has a crack in it. The mold is cold. The mold has to be up to 600 degrees for the metal to flow equally. So we heat the mold up as we pour spoons in it. By the third or fourth spoon, the mold will be up to 600 degrees as well, and, and the spoons will flow out better. So I can't do anything with that spoon. What I'm looking for is a perfect cast with no flaws, and I'm going to clean it up to look like this one. At the end of the day, when I'm all done demonstrating, we go to working on the finished ones. First thing I have to do is remove the sprue. That's the knob on the end there. That's where the opening of the mold is. That's just excess. We cut that off. And you see around the mold line, it's razor sharp. So I have to spend about 10, 15 minutes of sanding and filing to get the spoon to look like this one. That's the hard work at the end of the day. Now the ones that don't turn out, I can't fix them. So we're going to go from solid, turn it right back the liquid just like that. Once it hits its melting point at 600 degrees, 
turns right back to melted metal, and we start all over again. It is important, uh, in fact, to, to look at these objects and try to understand what people use here at Fort St. Joseph, to try to understand the context of the period. If we really truly want to understand uh, the people and the way life was literally happening here at Fort St. Joseph, we, under, we have to understand the objects that we're using, where they were coming from, and who used them. What I have here is a costite, which is, can be translated actually from French to English as a headbreaker. And it was literally a tomahawk or a hatchet. It would have been used primarily as a weapon or possibly used as a small tool also to, to mend things around camp. These types of hatchets were actually made here at Fort St. Joseph. There was a blacksmith by the name of Antoine de Aitre, which worked here between, well, at least we have records going back to 1739 and all the way up to 1750. And we know that he was making these because on his invoices, he would charge for making costites. Now you'll notice this one here as a rounder eye versus a flat oval, which is a characteristic of Canadian-made or country-made, colonial-made axis. This one's fairly short, and you'll notice that there's one stamp, which designates the smaller axis. So these axes were quite popular, and every voyager, native, or soldier, probably living around or traveling to Fort St. Joseph, would have been equipped with one of these incredibly made costites. Now this knife here is a CMY knife. It's a French folding knife, which was very, very popular, especially as a trade item. Now we have in fact found um, dozens, if not dozens of these blades here on the site. And they're all actually marked with uh, cutler's marks or, or maker's marks that come from Saint Etienne, France. Okay, the second knife I'll be talking about is a boucheron knife. So it was, in, essence a butcher knife. Now the French used the word boucheron and in the inventories and in the invoices and primary source documents in French they would always use the term boucheron to designate these knives. As you can see here it's got a half tang so the tang doesn't actually go through to the base of the handle. It stops midway. There are two pins to hold the uh, blade in place. And there's a very specific shape to the blade where it kind of droops down a little here that makes it very French versus an English butcher knife that was actually upturned slightly. The French boucheron knives always had a mark on their blade. And of course, these were made in the same town as the folding CMY knives. Well, what I have here in hand is a French fusil. Now, this fusil is actually a hunting gun, and this was very popular, especially here at Fort St. Joseph. The model I'm holding here in my hand was made in a manufactory in France called Saint Etienne. And uh, this specific type of gun is a flintlock, which works with a flintlock mechanism here. This model was very popular around the 17. 45 to 1759 period. Now, many such guns were found here at Fort St. Joseph, although they are a little finer and probably trade guns or guns used by the voyageur. This specific model, as you can see, is mounted in walnut. It's uh, also got a side plate, a trigger guard, and a butt plate made of iron, and it is marked with the maker's mark here on the lock plate. It is a very lengthy gun. Uh, the barrel probably measures roughly 45 and a half inches, and this is probably one of the shorter guns you can find on the market at that period. What was it like? What was it like to handle a musket? What, what was it like to sleep in a tent in a driving rainstorm? What was it like to have your, your shoes wet and your feet cold? And we learn a lot about history. We develop, a, I think, a sympathy for the people who lived at that time and a better understanding of their lives. The century that I represent, which is um, the 18th and 19th century, uh, requires that women have certain roles that they play and 
Um, I enjoy those kinds of things. My life revolves around cooking and sewing and socializing with other women, um, being protected by my husband and being connected to him. And um, I'm able to give people a living demonstration of what women's lives were like uh, which is missing in a lot of presentations because many times um, events revolve around a battle and around the military aspect of it, but we women in the 18th and 19th century were very involved from a different perspective. The ladies certainly would be accompanying their families during these musters, and that meant teenagers and children, and women always kept their hands busy. Many women looked forward to opportunities to come to an encampment or a militia muster because there were going to be other women there. Rather than just sitting and sewing and sewing and sewing, they could sit together and sew and visit, catch up on fashion, catch up on the news. Perhaps even someone who could read would read aloud to them from the latest novel, and that was very exciting. There were limited opportunities when you were home with your children to get together with other women. So they very much enjoyed the time that they had. In a militia muster in the, in the colonial time, any time that people all gathered together for the women that may have been scattered out uh, a broad area, this would be an opportunity to get together, sew together, gossip, um, of course, the dancing and listening to music, and learning any, any new skills with, with sewing. Um, frequently when women gathered together to sew, someone who was able to read, because not everyone was, w might read to the women either something entertaining or enlightening or, um, or sacred. Here at a muster, you certainly had musicians, a fife, a drum, and that was enough. If anyone knew a dance, they did it. Colonial dancing at the time, it was very, um, it was very important to learn it because it showed how well educated you were, and if you didn't know how to dance, well, you, you might. You couldn't attend the social gathering. It was embarrassing, so you really needed to learn how to dance and everything. And why do we do it? Uh, well, Jay Anderson, a uh, historian who, who actually liked reenactors, said that reenactors were sort of the lunatic fringe of history. And uh, we like getting our, hands, uh, getting our hands dirty a little bit. We like trying things out. We like experiencing it ourselves. And I think it gives us a, a feel, a link to the past. Immersion interpretive uh, events are the type of events that basically bring the public back to that century. Everything that we bring with us was researched from people of that, that time period. And the clothing is all hand stitched. It's made from the same types of cloth that they used back then. Even the garters, my wife uh, weaves on a uh, box loom, an 18th century box loom. Um, the food that we eat is uh, documented to have been eaten back then. When you're actually living history, I think it makes it come more alive to you in different ways. You begin to think like they would have thought, like, I never realized you have to have servants to get into these gowns, to get into these costumes. I mean, being a modern girl, I always read the history books and thought, 
Why do they need ten servants to get into <laughs> this dress? I could have done it in five minutes. And on that note, that also <laughs> includes um, why they had to have servants on the everyday chores because they you'll find quickly you can't bend over when the gentlemen always came and picked things up for the girls. If they dropped stuff, it was basically because they couldn't bend over and get it. Well, so what? What do we do? We do all of this research. We do all of the expense, uh, sometimes the discomfort of reenacting, uh, the dis discomfort certainly of archaeology, going out there in the field, finding the artifacts, learning about the people of the past. So what? Well, the past is still alive in many ways. And what we're experiencing today, we can understand our lives to better, better today by learning about their lives of 200 years ago. Many of the same things that they had to deal with, we're still, still dealing with today. Uh, the past is prologue. The people that lived at this period were very important in, in creating the country that you live in today with the freedoms that you have today. And if we don't appreciate that, and if we don't look back to those people and see the sacrifices that they made for the freedoms that you now enjoy, we're not going to know where we're going in the future. Well, I think there's a lot of value to the public of seeing a reenactment. They get to participate a little bit in it too, uh, sometimes vicariously. But again, they read about uh, these things, they read about this time period, here they actually get to see it. They get to see the, uh, the weapons, the tents, the clothing, uh, all in use. And they get to talk to the reenactors. And a lot of the reenactors are incredibly knowledgeable about the 18th century. And they have a tremendous knowledge of the minutia. Yes, they can talk about the economics and they can talk about the politics, but they can also talk about the tools of the time, the, uh, the clothing of the time. Not just that it was a, a red coat, but how it was used. Who wrote, wore what kind of coat? Who wore what kind of uniform? What the differences were? And, and really get into the minutia of that. Learn about the everyday life. And so the public gets to experience that too. They get to see uh, sort of the end result of our scholarship, what we're learning and what we're bringing into practice. I am doing this because I actually really enjoy uh, colonial dancing. I love the feel of the different costumes and different atmospheres that we experience here at Fort St. Joseph and uh, because I love it that much that's why I'm doing it. I chose to do the American Revolution partially because it's a really interesting part of history to portray. The founding of our nation, the clashing of two empires, and um, overall it's just a wonderful period of history to bring to life. Both Hazel and I go out to symposiums in um, Williamsburg and Gatsby's Tavern. Uh, Hazel has brought people for our overall organization to do workshops to learn the construction techniques. Uh, so we're not just making something that looks like the thing from, from the 18th does. century. Right. Mm -hmm. But that is actually constructed in the same way. I've seen these, these items that they're pulling out of the ground that have been sitting underground for 200 years and um, that just fascinates me because it's like yeah I know what that does that your average Joe would see that and not have any idea what that piece is but I know exactly like, if they pulled out a couple parts of a flintlock musket and I know what those pieces do and so I think that's a big inspiration to me is just thinking about what was going on here on this very spot the people that were walking here the people that were living here and that inspires me to come to these events and try to pass that knowledge on. Hopefully we have brought a, a good quality of living history, history to the uh, colonial era for this time period. For us coming here to this site, it helps us help the museum to do more archaeology. You know, we're bringing people here to get more interest in it and, and as well as interest in what we're doing here. Uh, it's magic. The whole history thing is magic. One of the things that I think is so important about what's being done here at Fort St. Joseph with the archaeological dig is that we're taking this 
very important site. People in Europe knew about Fort St. Joseph, but today we know so little about it. There's uh, very little known about this fort, and the students are uncovering these artifacts and filling in this tremendous gap in knowledge. The fort had so much here that we know so little about. The students are turning up buttons and tinkling cones and, and rings. We can document with certainty what they were using at a given time. We know now so much more about those people and it's exciting because they have just scratched the surface. They're just starting and we're already learning so much.